Here we go. Hey, everybody. It's Cider Week Hudson Valley. I'm Scott Ramsey. I'm the executive director of the New York Cider Association. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this amazing group of people that we have here. This is definitely the jewel in the crown of all of our events we've had this week. It's been a phenomenal week of some really incredible programming um, that you can check out over at our YouTube channel at New York Cider Association TV. But let me introduce you to this crew. This is amazing. So we have Megan Larmer from Glenwood. Wave hello, Megan. <laughs> and we have Tim Buzinski from Artisan Wine Shop. And we have hey. executive chef Suzanne Cups from 232 Bleecker Street, which we're so excited to welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, as you all know, this is a dinner date. So the idea is to prepare dinner, get some beautiful ciders to pair with that dinner. Uh, and then we all sit and we chat and we talk about um, the experience. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna play the video that Suzanne so beautifully put together um, around her actually cooking the dishes. And then we'll come back and we'll have a live chat um, around uh, all the experiences that we're having with the food and the pairings of the cider, um, which Megan will lead. So before we go to the video, just know that if you're watching, you can absolutely comment and chat with us in the chat and comment section of your platform, whether you're on YouTube or our Cider Week Facebook page. And um, when we can see those comments and we can respond. So if you have questions uh, for our panel or for anybody or any thoughts or comments on the experience, just feel free to let us know. All right, so without further ado, let me cut away to the video and we'll get to cooking here. Let me make sure I've got share audio checked. Perfect. All right, here we go. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. My name is Suzanne Cup. I'm the executive chef of a restaurant called 232 Bleecker. Uh, we're in Manhattan in the West Village on Bleecker and Carmine Street. And um, I've been working with Glenwood for a while and um, really love the farm up there and all the initiatives they put forth and really excited to be doing um, this week's um, market box. So I um, have been working with them on sourcing some of my favorite vegetables for the summer. Um, we're going to make a uh, summer squash cavatelli pasta and also a strawberry rhubarb galette. Now, desserts aren't normally my strong uh, suit in terms of cooking, but I've been spending a lot of uh, time at home, of course, uh, as you guys have too during this coronavirus and um, have really uh, had some fun making some, some desserts. So the strawberry rhubarb galette is one of my favorites. Um, I thought we could make that together. So um, we're going to start off with making the pasta first. Um, one of the things about pasta is uh, it is pretty quick and easy, this one. Um, I'm using a uh, cavatelli from a company called Spog Spoglini. They're out of Brooklyn. Um, and it's just like a super delicious dried pasta. They do do some fresh ones too. Um, but I used to use this at, at, um, at the restaurant um, before we started making pastas. And it's just a really delicious um, pasta. They use a lot of local grains um, from the Northeast too. So um, I always feel, feel really good about that. So the first thing I'm going to bear with me as I change my camera angles here to try to get um, some shots of the cooking. I have a pot on here and I've got it um, warm. I'm going to bring it up to a boil. It's you want to kind of make sure your water is like a half or two thirds full um, so that you have room for it to boil and the pasta not boil over. I'm going to make sure I season it really heavily with salt um, or else that pasta won't take on that, that flavor. Um, and this pasta cooks for about nine minutes or so. So I've got my pasta water going. I'm gonna do these both at the same time, but if you don't feel good about cooking the pasta while you're making your um, sauce and vegetables, then you can always cook the pasta first and hold it um, and then go ahead and um, put it together at the end. That's just as easy. Um, so one thing I like to do when I'm making something that's a little quicker is I like to have all my meat, uh, what we call mise en place, all the vegetables, all the knife cuts and everything ready. So um, we've got some uh, cherry tomatoes. We have a couple different kinds of squash here. I've got my cubes of butter, some minced garlic um, and Fresno chilies. Um, and you can omit the chilies if you aren't into spicy, but I like to have all that ready. So it makes me um, pretty fast and efficient when I'm cooking. Um, okay, so my pan here is fairly warm. I'm going to turn it up to about medium and add just a little bit of olive oil to get the squash cooking. 
I have a, I'm using a nonstick just because it's the size pan I want for home. I'm just making it for myself today. So I'm just making a one portion, but, um, if you have a, a, a regular pan, that's just as good as a nonstick. So I want to get my oil kind of hot. And then I'm going to go ahead and add my squash in. And I like to get a little color on the squash. Um, if you cook it too long, it gets a bit mushy. Uh, so you don't really want, you, you don't need to fully cook it. Um, you just want to get some flavor in there and a little bit of browned. Summer squash is so delicate. You can really eat it raw. It's just, it, it, it builds some flavor if you have some color on it. And I like to go ahead and season that with some salt right away. And then let it, let it kind of sit for a bit. You can use a spatula if you need every once in a while, but you want to get that brownness. So if you, if you are messing with it or, or stirring it too much, then it won't, it won't generate some of that brown color on the side. So I'm going to let that sit for a minute. So I have um, I have a zucchini tonight today, the green one, and also some patty pan squash. Um, I just love the variety. So whatever you get in your box, um, it does taste similar, but um, I, I like the look of all having all the, the different squash. So my water is um, about to come up to a boil. I'm gonna give it maybe another minute there. And while I have my squash in, I'm gonna be taking this out of the pan. So I want to make sure I have something to put it on. So I'm just going to um, grab a bowl and put um, a paper towel in it so that when I take the when I take the squash out of here, I have something to kind of drain it on. Um, and you can stir it or flip it however you like to go. But you can see it's already developing some color. And um, it depends how small you cut it. So if you cut it really thin, it's going to cook very quickly. If you cut it a little thicker, it might take just a bit longer. All right, so in the back, my water is um, up to a boil. So I'm gonna drop my pasta in there. And the, on the, uh, Spogolini says that it cooks for about nine minutes. I think, um, you know, it depends how fast your water is going, how much pasta you have in there. It could take anywhere from nine to 12 minutes to cook. So again, let's take a look. So I've got some nice color on my squash there. For me, I like it to have that bite. So I don't want to actually cook it too much longer than this. Um, because I like I like a little texture in my pasta. So I'm going to take this out and I'm just going to take the whole thing and drain it on the oil and everything. And I'm going to start with fresh oil here. So going to stir this pasta once, make sure it's not sticking to the bottom. All right, I'm going to add just a little bit more oil, and we're going to start with the cherry tomatoes. So tomatoes, I like um, I like this kind of sauce for a summer preparation um, rather than just like a canned tomato sauce. I think it's fresh, and there's so many beautiful tomatoes um, all summer in this area. So um, sometimes so I wash my tomatoes earlier and let them dry. If you have some water on it, it they, they might kind of pop a bit. Um, so it's better to dry them off so you don't have that spotted. And I'm just going to put those tomatoes in. I have them whole with the skins on and everything. And I'm going to season with a little salt. I like to season with salt kind of in every step. Not to, not to make something salty, but to make sure that each part of the dish is seasoned. And I'm going to let these tomatoes kind of cook and blister for a couple minutes. Again, if the tomatoes are bigger and you want to cut them in half, that's totally fine too. Um, these are small enough that I can just kind of keep them whole and they'll, they'll slowly reduce their, uh, release their juices as they go. I'll toss those doing well over here. Now, another thing in this recipe, um, I have that you can use either chicken stock or you can use pasta water if you want to make a vegetarian or if you don't have chicken stock. Either is fine. So I'm just going to show you. You can see there's a little color on those tomatoes now. I'm going to turn my heat down just a touch. And I'm going to just take a little bit of this pasta water. It's flavor. It's flavorful. It has like some starch in it. Um, so I'm going to take a little of this for later uh, so I don't forget and throw it all out. So I can use this in my um, in my sauce. All right. So my tomatoes are pretty thin skin, which happens a lot. Um, so they're already kind of blistering. So I'm going to go ahead and turn my heat down because I'm going to add my garlic next. 
And what you don't want to do is burn your garlic or your chili. So I have um, just kind of chili ri uh, rings of Fresno, but you can do, um, you can mince it if you don't want as much, or you can leave it out, or you can use a dried, dried chili. So now that my pan is kind of cooling a little bit, I'm going to put in that garlic and Fresno. And here's again, because it's cut smaller, I want to make sure it doesn't burn. So I'm going to either use a spatula or a spoon or something. And I'm going to stir it. And this is going to cook fast. It's really fragrant. I can smell it a ton right now. I don't really need to cook this a ton. So what I don't want to do is, is let it burn. So I'm going to go ahead here and, and add my butter. So I add the butter first. If I add water to this, it kind of splatters and reduces. But if I add the butter, I can kind of cool the pan down just a touch. And then I can add my pasta water here. And now I just want to slowly reduce this to make like a nice thick sauce. Check on this pasta. I don't want to reduce my sauce too much, so if you can see it's simmering pretty pretty rapidly, I'm going to turn it just down below here. Now, the reason why I'm keeping my squash separate is if I add it right now, it's going to make the it's going to boil the squash and it's going to make it mushy. So I'm going to wait until I add my pasta back to add the squash. And see, it has just a really nice kind of emulsified creamy sauce. It's light, it's a great way that the garlic and the chilies are really flavor, flavoring the, the sauce and the tomatoes are kind of leaching out their juices there. So I'm just gonna keep this warm since my pasta is not ready um, until, until I'm ready to go with that. And then I'm gonna, um, gonna dump that in. Okay, my pasta is now about how I like it. It's been about 10 minutes. And again, it depends how um, al dente you like it. I always just like to taste a piece. And that's pretty good. So I have my a strainer here. I'm just going to strain out all the, the hot water. And I'm going to go right into my pasta sauce. Get that back to simmer. I'm going to go right with this guy in. And then I'm going to add my squash. Now, everything I seasoned along the way, but um, you definitely want to taste and adjust how you like it. I like that just like really um, just a little sauce to coat. If you want it thicker, you can add just a little bit more butter. Um, the Parmesan is going to help it too. So I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to put a little pepper in mine black pepper here. And then I'm going to go right in with the Parmesan just to, again, kind of thicken that sauce a bit and be generous. I think it needs, it needs that fat and that, that flavor from the, the Parmesan. And then I'm going to give it a toss and that looks good to me. Taste it to make sure it doesn't need any more salt. Mm, good. That garlic is really nice. Okay, so now I just have a bowl here. And then not to be fancy, I'm just going to go right in carefully. And then I've got, uh, if you want a little more Parmesan, go for a little on top. If you like, um, like it a little spicier, you can add some chili flakes to the top. And then I've got... Um, Basil, I just like to just tear it rather than cutting it. Basil gets um, kind of browned really easy. So this just nice. It smells really aromatic, the whole pasta. I have this little basil. It's called bush basil that I'm growing. Um, so I've got some of those that I'm going to put on. Again, this whole, a whole pasta is just, it's like a nice, light, summery treat. So let's see if I can walk you over to the window where you can see a little bit better. Um, Oh yeah, this is the uh, summer squash cavatelli. Okay, next we're gonna make our strawberry rhubarb galette. 
Um, so first thing we want to do is make sure to turn our oven on to 425 so that it's ready when we're ready to bake. So I've got a pot here. Um, you can do one with lower sides if um, that's what you have, but this one works pretty well so I can stir. Um, and I have my rhubarb cut up, um, just kind of like cut thinly like you would celery. And I've got some minced ginger that I put in there together. And I'm just going to add that to the pot. It doesn't have to be hot yet. Um, I have a quarter cup of sugar that I'm going to add, and I'm going to do an eighth cup of water. Water just kind of helps get it going so that sugar doesn't burn. And the reason I'm adding my um, rhubarb first is it's just a little heartier than the strawberries, so I want to try to, to cook this down um, first. So I'm just melting the sugar at the beginning, and then um, I'm going to give this maybe about five minutes or so until it starts to soften. Um, I can already smell the ginger immediately. So um, I'm sure uh, a lot of people have had strawberry rhubarb together. Um, it's definitely a, a classic combination, uh, especially in the Northeast, rhubarb's kind of late spring, um, early summer, and strawberries come um, right at the end of spring um, and then here all summer. So. Uh, it, there isn't a huge window when the two are found together, but um, right now it is. And um, rhubarb can be used for savory um, preparations, but uh, a lot of times it's it's uh, used in, in baking. Um, and the only thing to remember about rhubarb is it's really, really tart. So I don't like to add a lot of sugar. I don't like really sweet desserts, but, um, but you kind of need that sugar to be able to... Um, to cut some of that tartness. Now you can use other other types of um, sugar substitutes. You can also use like honey. Um, it won't have exactly the same flavor, but it'll it'll definitely work. Um, so I've got my um, rhubarb. It's just kind of simmering. I don't need to turn it to a high high boil, but I want it to start cooking down a bit. Again, if you cut it thinner, um, it's going to cook quicker. If it's a little thicker, um, it, it might take a, a little longer. Now everything's going to become soft like a compote, so it's not really necessary to keep the structure of the rhubarb. But I do like I like little chunks in my in my um, end result there. So I've got that on. Um, I have my strawberries. Um, it depends on what size it is. Mine were pretty small, so I just went ahead and cut them like kind of in half. Um, these are called TriStar strawberries, um, and we get them from a farm, uh, Mountain Sweet Berry, and. Uh, they're called TriStar because they are here for three different seasons. So they come in in the spring, they're here for summer, and at the beginning of fall, which is pretty awesome. They're super sweet. And I always can tell like a market strawberry because it's like red on the inside and not white, like a lot of the commercially grown ones. So I'm going to reserve that um, until kind of this rhubarb starts cooking down after a minute or two. So we're going to give this just a little time to cook. Okay, my rhubarb is getting really soft. Um, kind of, you can still see pieces in it, but uh, pretty soft there. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, add my cut strawberries. And then um, the juice of half a lemon. These little juicers are nice to make sure you get everything out of it. And I, since I'm a savory chef, I, I add salt to pretty much everything. It brings out the flavor, and I think it brings out the flavor of strawberry. So I'm just doing like a little pinch of salt. Doesn't have to be too much. Um, and I'm just gonna stir this um, every every you know minute or two, just so it cooks evenly and it it doesn't stick to the bottom. But um, I want to cook this down. And again, like the strawberries are soft and tender. Um, I want it to be a little chunky, so I'm going to let this go for maybe about 15 minutes, just until it makes like that compote, like a really thick kind of jam. Okay, so it's been about 15 minutes, and I think this is pretty good. I like the look of it, it tastes good, and I like it to have a little chunkiness, everything's cooked. So again, that's the, I think the key is just like give it a taste, and you want it to be just a little thick too so that when it sits on the pie crust, it doesn't, it's not too runny. So now um, I have the pie crust here and 
again, you can make your own. I have a recipe, um, or you can really easily buy too at the store. Most every grocery store has it. So when you have your flat dough, make sure it stays cold. So you want to keep it in the fridge while you're while you're making the the compote. You just want to kind of fold it over, and it should look a little rustic. You're just kind of like um, giving it a quarter fold every couple inches, and it doesn't need to, to look perfect. I think it actually looks better if it's just a little little mismatch shape. So I've got that. I've got one more here that I made. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take some of this um, compote that I made, and I just want to put it right into the middle. So I, I don't want to really get on the outer flaps. Um, I kind of want to just keep it. And it's going to spread a bit. And then I, I don't want to use it all because I want to reserve about half of it um, for when it's done baking. So I have like um, kind of a fresh compote to put on top. So I think that's pretty good. My oven's at 425. Um, I It depends how thick your crust is. I think this one's going to take about 25 minutes. Um, I'm going to set my timer for 20 just to check it in case. Um, and then uh, see how brown it is and if it's cooked, especially on the edges where um, it's a little more doughy. Okay, it's been exactly 25 minutes and uh, I think my glitz are ready. So I'm gonna take them out of the oven. Yeah, nice little brownness. Another kind of set. I just wanna kind of feel, make sure that this dough is cooked along the edges, and I think so. So I think that's pretty good. So you can um, you can hold these and eat them later or tomorrow, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and plate one up right now for us. So um, I'm just going to take take it right off. Whew. I'll brace that one, the spatula is a little small. I'm gonna put it right on the plate there. And then let me just stir a little bit. So I'm gonna spoon some of um, some fresh cut strawberries just over the top. And again, there's a lot of flavor going on already. It just to have kind of like a little bit of freshness. I didn't I didn't do anything to these. I think they're pretty good as they are. And then I'm going to take, um, because all the compote is baked, I just want to take a little bit of this fresh um, compote and kind of spoon it over top here. And then I've got some honey. Instead of using more sugar, I'm just going to use some, um, some local honey. Just kind of drizzle it over the top, over the strawberries. Maybe even take some and drizzle it on the, the crust here. I got a lot of crust going on and it'll taste pretty good. And then the last thing I've got is, um, I just have the other half of my lemon that I didn't use. And I go, excuse me, casualties and we're doing it in your own home kitchen. I've got a little lemon and I'm just gonna kind of zest the outside. Again, just kind of giving it that freshness so it's it eats like it should in the summertime, not kind of a, heavy winter pie. Um, and that's it. I think um, I think you could use a, a big scoop of ice cream or whipped cream too. All right. So this is our final uh, strawberry galette. Looks pretty good, I think. I think I'm gonna eat this right now. Again, my name is Suzanne Cups. Um, thanks so much for joining me to cook some uh, summery dishes. I hope you guys have fun doing it at home. And um, please, when you're in the city, um, in a couple months, we'll be open and um, love to have you um, at 232 Bleaker. So thanks, see ya. <laughs>
Um, so I am actually going to enjoy this delicious bowl um, that my dear friend actually prepared for me. I've been so crazy all day, I wasn't able to cook, but she literally just made it happen while that video was playing. So I'm gonna enjoy this. I'm gonna back off the screen and Megan, let you just uh, take it away. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Scott. It's so great to um, round out Cider Week Hudson Valley, our first virtual edition. Uh, with the two of you, Tim and Susie, it's been an amazing, um, amazing experience for me to learn about cider and food alongside you. Uh, just as a little reintroduction in, in case folks are just tuning in or um, we're wrapped up in, in the magic of that meal preparation. Um, I'm Megan Larmer, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Director of Regional Food at Glenwood and have had the great pleasure of uh, working on Glenwood Cider Project alongside Tim and Susie. Tim Bazinski is the um, owner of uh, Artists and Wine Shop in Beacon and Susie Cups, as we said, is Executive Director of 232 Bleecker Street. So um, one of the reasons I was excited about having this conversation with all of you is you know, that we, we have spent time each in our own individual spheres, but also as a group thinking through what it means to eat and drink regionally and, um, and why that is so important for the sustainability of a regional food system. I do want to say I'm getting like a fair amount of background noise. Is that, is that coming through for you too, Tim and Susie, or are you guys okay? It's good. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's you good. Okay? Yeah. yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Great. So, um, I, I want to sort of hold that theme of regional cooking, of tying together the beauty of the Hudson Valley agriculture with the amazing product that is showcased in this meal as we go into um, talking through the really thoughtful tastings and pairings that we have here. So um, I'd like to invite you to start with our, our first cider. Tim, if you would like to talk a little bit about what you've chosen for the sort of aperitif pairing and uh, how that cidery fits into to the Hudson Valley cider landscape. Okay, so um, when you say first cider, I'm talking about the treasury cider half cent, right? So yes, yes. so this is um, Josh Morithal, who is a friend of ours um, at Fishkill Farms. Um, he basically, our student that uh, sort of came back to the farm and started um, sort of renewing a, a love and a passion for uh, farming and started making cider, um, kind of dabbled in it a little bit initially, and then eventually founded the Treasury Cider label, which is named after, uh, because uh, his great-grandfather was the um, uh, Secretary of the Treasury Department during um, FDR's kind of like tenure. So that's where that comes from. So they're actually working with a lot of different types of fruit. Um, so they had some, some, you know, sort of like what we call culinary apples, meaning the kind of things you would eat out of hand and be cooking with. Um, for pies and different things like that, but then also um, had started doing a little bit more heirloom varieties, but have also now kind of like moved into some really specific cider apples. So we're getting a really good blend here. Um, this is something that is just released, um, super fresh, bright, clean in terms of profile, and super cleansing. So with a cheese, um, this is the Rascal Cheese from McGrath. Um, which has a little bit of that sort of like creamy, earthy kind of like profile to it. That little bit of, of fattiness is there. The, the bubbles on this and the refreshment on this is just perfect for, for cleansing the palate per se. And the flavor profile works really well together as well. The earthiness of the cheese and a little bit of that earthy kind of like flavor from the cider itself. Awesome. Yeah, I think, I think this pairing works really, really nicely. Um, and that the brightness of the cider is definitely cutting through the fattiness of that cheese for me in a really nice way. Something else I noticed, you know, as I was opening this bottle this evening, was uh, that Treasury lists the year that the trees were, were planted in addition to the year of the vintage. So I wonder if there's anything you'd share with us a bit about um, how that matters, especially as we're thinking about the importance of connecting cider to our agricultural landscape. Well, age, age of trees is, is super helpful. I mean, it takes like three years before you're really going to start getting a specific sort of crop from the apples themselves. And um, of course, over time with the same thing with vineyards, you get more complexity in those apples when you get older trees themselves because they put more energy and more focus into actually um, creating more fruit as opposed to creating more growth. Um, while even though these are... Um, not necessarily super old plantings, like they're not 20, 25 year old plantings. The reality is the 
complexity of the fruit that they planted is what makes these ciders fantastic. Meaning that they have essentially, in some ways, saved some of these like really rare varieties that wouldn't be used if it wasn't being used in, in cider itself. And so we really get this like layered complexity. So we get more tannin and more acid in those uh, varieties that really allows us to really make this work with food because that's technically what kind of makes food and wine, but and also cider work really well together is a lot of those structural components kind of like work, like the acidity and the tannin and the bubbles themselves are super cleansing. So that's um, where a lot of that works. But definitely the, the this development of these trees, it's going to continue to be even better in four years, and two years, and three years. Um, yeah. And I think there's a real allegory there for, for the cider industry and even for the development of a regional cuisine in the Hudson Valley, right? That um, yeah. these tree plantings aren't necessarily so old, but apples have been grown here for uh, several hundred years since the, the first colonizers brought them with them and planted them. But the cider industry itself is quite nascent, um, as is right. the, yeah. the development of our, our sort of culinary agriculture here. So. Maybe we could transition there, Susie, into thinking about the inspiration you had for this amazing pasta dish. So if you, if you just want to maybe remind us what the dish is and talk a little bit about why these are the ingredients that you've um, chosen and what your sort of ethos around cooking from, from regional production is. Sure. Yeah, I really, um, I'm not uh, an Italian chef and I've just recently started making pastas on my own. Uh, but I think it's just one of those dishes that's really easy for the whole family to love. Um, and I, I like taking um, kind of traditional dishes and really, um, really thinking about what are the ingredients that go into it. Um, I think summertime is just a, a perfect time to, to make something that's filling uh, like a pasta, but then you can make it, um, you know, full of vegetables too. Um, you can almost throw anything that's in your in your fridge that's left over into like that that pasta um, type of sauce. So. Um, this one is made with um, a dried pasta from Svoblini, which is out of Brooklyn. I actually look, live in Brooklyn and um, I used to use their um, products before I made pasta. And I really like like what they do. I like how they source their grains regionally. They use, actually, I'm, I'm, I made one today. Um, it's an einkorn um, uh, pasta macaroni. Um, I didn't have any of the cavatelli at home, but it's the Svoblini um, einkorn um, uh, flour and and I just I really like their story um, and then uh, zucchini squash it's just it's very accessible for everyone it's um, it's great here in the Northeast um, and that combination of the cherry tomatoes um, and the zucchini is just um, is, is something that I would want to eat every day especially when you when you throw in aromatics so the garlic the um, the chilies and and the basil at the end um, I think that's something if you're cooking and um, you know, you live with someone else. If they, that would make them come into the room and say, "Oh, what's for dinner?" Um, so I like to I like to do that. And um, this menu actually is a little heavier than I generally eat. Um, both a pasta and a glut are kind of heavier items than I would generally cook or choose to eat. But again, I think it's all about the that seasonal aspect and those vegetables. And um, and if you cook with um, products that are really fresh. Um, and know just a little nuance of how to do it, you can make something that is less of, I need to take a nap and more of, um, let's hang out and you know watch this thunderstorm that's about to happen here in Brooklyn. So, um, and yeah, I think talking about uh, local sourcing, um, I'm sure everybody had, uh, well, maybe not everybody, but a lot of us had time during COVID to just think and reflect and, decide like what am i doing is this the right move and um i've only ever cooked in new york and in, in the city and um and now my cooking is so um ingrained in this uh seasonal produce and and thinking about there's other places that have great produce but they access the um the distribution here plus just like the number of farmers that are really uh paying attention to organic practices and um and growing things for flavor um is it's it's hard to find other places and um so i don't know as i i thought about like is i'm not from new york is this the place for me i just i have a hard time um leaving um you know when i'm so close to places like the hudson valley with with great farming yeah that that i think that's one of the things i've always so appreciated about mm -hmm. your cooking is that it really um uses uses sometimes complicated and sometimes simple techniques but to really elevate the cleanliness of the flavor mm -hmm. in those foods and so um 
I guess my question for you would be if you could talk a little bit about how maybe that plays into the development of the menu that you've been working on for 232 Bleecker Street and, and where cider fits in um, as a chef for you in that in that menu and that menu development. Yeah, so 232 is a very new restaurant. We were open uh, December 16th of last year. So it was exactly three months to the day when we had to close for Corona. So very, very new. Um, I cooked before that. I was the chef of a restaurant called Untitled at the Whitney Museum and before that at Gramercy Tavern and then uh, working with Anita Lowe at Anissa. And um, throughout all of my cooking career, about 15 years, it's um, it's been based on the ingredients. And so I really had that good foundation, um, especially working for Mike Anthony. Um, he he knows Glenwood. He's been up uh, to see you guys and um, just kind of that mentality of it. It is important. Um, it's not just about a show. It's not about like the final presentation and what it looks like. It's it's about sourcing. It's about um, having those relationships, meeting those people that you want to support, knowing what are their practices and then tasting it and saying like, you know, oh, okay, this, this tastes good. So I want to put it on my plate. And I think I've taken it even a step further. Um, in 232 Bleecker is not, um, is not a fancy restaurant. Um, we, we try to do things carefully, but um, it's recognizable, the food we cook. And um, I want to take a step farther where um, less manipulation. Uh, I feel if the farmers are going to all the, the trouble to grow things that are really delicious and, and really beautiful too, um, I, I want to try to show off those vegetables in their natural state a little bit more. Um, so as a chef, I don't just put it on the plate. I still have to do something to it, but I've really been trying to um, hone my techniques, um, especially with vegetable cookery, um, of how to like show that off. And the food I cook, like I mentioned, is um, is often uh, light, and I try to really um, create a lot of balance. Um, and things like cider just pair really well with my food. Um, I use I do use a lot of acidity, um, uh, not too many complicated flavors. Um, I, I like to have that that clean food, and I, I think cider really really pairs very well. Um, and I was lucky enough um, with Megan and Tim to spend some time um, in Spain a couple of years ago and talking about. Um, cider and understanding, meeting more of the growers from the Hudson Valley, um, and just like hearing more about just the tr traditions behind cider and why it's important, and even more so why it's important to support local products um, like like the apples and apples and the vineyards in the Hudson Valley. So um, I definitely think just the food I cook is naturally paired with um, this treasury cider is really delicious. Haven't had this one. It's delicious, yeah, yeah. And I, I love, I love what you're saying about the the relationships being key to that because I think that was a big takeaway mm -hmm. for um, those of us who were able to to attend that that learning trip in Spain. Um, and then again, you know, that cohort came back to the Hudson Valley to try to translate some of those ideas to this place where we live and to to New York and um, mm -hmm. the Hudson region. And yeah, I think of the relationships between people, much like the, the relationships we see on the land and how amazing it is to have chefs like you who are able to, to translate some of that and to have drinks educators and experts like Tim. So Tim, let's talk about the relationship of these ciders to this dish, shall we? I think you're muted, Tim. Thank you. you so we have two ciders here that we've kind of done. So they're very different sort of like profiles. So the first cider is um, the bandwagon, and that is from Rose Hill Farm. So this cider um, I chose because it has a particular sort of herbaceous kind of profile, and that comes from the fact that they have added um, Cabernet Franc skins, which are great skins. Um, sorry. Guess what? My computer was going to restart. <laughs> that would have been fun. Okay. Um, perfect timing, Sunday night. Um, so Cabernet Franc skins, um, Cabernet Franc skins in this. So Cabernet Franc is known for this little bit of herbaceous kind of like profile. Oftentimes we would describe it as having a little bit of bell pepper or things of that nature. So when you taste this cider, I was looking at the sort of complementary sort of flavors that would happen with uh, first of all, the basil, but also even in some ways the zucchini itself. Um, but also looking at the acidity that would be there from the cherry tomatoes, because tomatoes are just are generally going to have that little acidity. Now, I noticed with the blistering and sort of like cooking of those that that sort of like acidity is lessened a little bit, but we still get 
you know, a nice sort of like balance in terms of that. So the idea behind the bandwagon was really kind of working off some of those herbaceous notes and sort of create, trying to create that connection where we'd have similar flavors between the dish and the cider itself. So basically, whenever we're talking about doing pairing, there's two ways that I generally approach it. One is either going to be to complement those flavors, or two is going to be a contrast of those flavors. So the second cider was more about a little bit of a contrast. So this is Metal House's uh, Rista cider. So this cider is totally made in the traditional method, so very complicated uh, sort of like process here. But one of the things that they do here is they finish this with uh, local honey. So they, in, in other words, at the end of the fermentation process, typically what you're gonna find is that you have a bone dry sort of cider or wine if you were making wine. And then you add just a little bit of sugar just to sort of like take off the edge, if you will. So here they haven't done that. They've added a little bit of local honey, which creates an aromatic profile, which again kind of picks up the aromatics on the basil, but also sort of like adds and lends a richer kind of like tone to this. In addition to that, there's a little bit more richness because this wine has, or sorry, this cider has been sort of resting on the lees. These are the dead yeast cells itself. And so that creates this extra level of depth and complexity. So this is the contrast that we're kind of like looking for with this. Both of these are coming from Old Orchard. I think maybe we're, we're losing Tim's connection a little bit. Is that true for you too, Susie? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sure he'll he'll be he'll be back with us in a moment. What is, should we should we try these with the pasta? I think you've got both of them there. Yeah. Yeah. Here we are. Yeah. Sorry, Tim. Oh, are you there back? You are, Tim, you're back. I'm here. All right. I was uh, just saying, should we go ahead and give these a try? Yeah, go ahead. I heard so heard everything, and now Suzanne's gone. Oh no. Well, I, I think Susie, you and I are still here. Shall we? Shall we yeah, I'm here. Yeah. I wish I wish we could eat and drink this together, but since we're since we're we're in this. Uh, Distanced moment. Should we go ahead and give it a try? <laughs> sure. See what we think. This dish looks so good. So excited. Watching myself through the cooking video um, reminds me that I don't want to be on Food Network anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> but well, you were so good. I would. I would pitch you to Food Network right now. I would. They cropped it pretty well because I dropped my camera in the sink a couple times. Blooper <laughs> reel. Mm, so I'm trying this with the bandwagon right now, and I am picking up on some of those herbaceous notes with the basil in particular, Tim, that you were that you were pointing out, which is which is interesting because I don't think I would have if we were thinking just about wine. I don't think Cab Franc would have been my first choice for a dish like this, right? So, yeah. What do you get? No, that would be too heavy. I, I would think. Yeah. Yeah, very um, interesting twist. But it sort of brings a level. That, that's one of the, I think, the brilliant things about the cider is because it's it just brings that little almost like it brings that red fruited kind of like note to the cider that makes it kind of like work. You could have this with you could have this cider with probably something that's even, you know, off the grill, a little bit meaty, not like, mm. you know, super, super, mm -hmm. super heavy meaty. Um, because of the fact that it has that little extra sort of like texture and maybe a little extra tannin that kind of comes from that. But um, yeah, and it's also just a, a really kind of like pretty color in general. So, so it's a great, and the aromatics think, yeah. to me are what kill on this cider. The aromatics to me are just to die for. I just, I just want to have my nose in the, in the glass constantly. It's really pretty. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. And I think that is a, a brilliant thing about ciders that it goes so well with vegetables, um, and in a way that can be really complex and interactive. With you know, I, I think ve vegetable cookery gets sort of slotted into a space as being less flavorful or less interesting because our our palates are not necessarily so well trained mm -hmm. to the distinctions between vegetables. Partly because, as you were saying, Susie, the you know the um, industrial. Uh, agricultural chain produces vegetables that have less flavor. They're, they're picked yeah. and not peak ripeness. They're not grown, you know, in, in soils that are rich in the nutrients that would make them particularly delicious. So yeah, I, I love that cider has the opportunity to play with local vegetables in that way and really bring out the, the uniqueness of them. Should we try the metal house next? Yeah. 
Yeah, I would try the middle one. Yep. Yeah. Cheers. So first off, you should probably get that little hint of honey on the nose. Um, that little floralness. But super dry, very clean. Again, that acidity in this cider is going to pick up the acidity from the, the cherry tomatoes. And hopefully those two things are going to basically cancel each other out. And then you end up getting to taste more of the zucchini. You taste a little bit more of the, um, even just the richness from the little butteriness, you know, that's, that's in the sauce itself. Um, and the garlic kind of like comes forward, the Fresno a little bit, the fruitiness of the, of the Fresno as well. That was the other thing about that I didn't mention about the bandwagon was the, the combination of like, almost like bell pepper notes and then chilies in the actual dish too. But keep going. Sorry to digress. That's all right. No, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit too of the, you know, I know you mentioned this is aged on the leaves. So there's some of that yeasty nuttiness, I think mm -hmm. is playing really well with the butteriness, but also with the Parmesan that's, mm -hmm. that's in the sauce. Yeah. Like I'm getting a little bit of that, that resonance there. Yeah. That's yeah. another really good point about the Parmesan because that Parmesan again is umami essentially. And, um, just creating this really complex addition of, of flavor to this. And then with something that is, Lee's age, that's almost your mommy as well in some ways uh, because it kind of creates its own sort of layer of complexity to it, um, of, of nuttiness. It's not really as much of a salty edge, but it has just this layer of complexity that's pretty intense. So, I think, uh, Megan, when you mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes vegetable cookery can, can seem boring for people. I think it is it, dishes that have like a little nuance, a little, um, you know, if you are cooking with vegetables to understand um you know if something's light to add just a little fat or a little richness through something like parmesan um or just a little spikes in flavor like when you get a piece of chili versus when you don't get a bite of chili um like to be able to have um some interesting bites amongst it so that it doesn't sit flat and i like going back and forth with the ciders because i think they complement each other really well but neither overtakes the other so i don't have so much heat in my pasta that you can't taste the cider and the cider is just not so strong that you know you can you can easily go back and forth with bites yeah there's a real nuance to this whole meal and yeah. pairing as well as like a vibrancy like it's not um it's not subtle but it's also not uh hitting you over the head in any way yeah. i think that's true of the, of the dish and of the ciders yeah 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 um if i may i mean on we kind of got into this a little bit on thursday night i was talking with um a number of cider makers and but Ryan Burke actually brought up the really good point that you know generally with cider we're talking about something that's generally less than 10% alcohol probably seven right. probably eight maybe nine um, and when you're talking about putting that with food that is like total home run like right there mm -hmm. and that's what you're talking about with vegetables like you're never gonna get that overwhelming thing to what you know Susie what you're saying it's like there's nothing is going to overwhelm a delicate vegetable kind of like style dish. Yeah. You can have almost the, the lightest of the light. And cider's not going to get in your face and, and make you feel like you're like, wow, you can't taste anything yeah. else. So brilliant the way that uh, that works. Awesome. I love, yeah, I love, I love everything about this. Shall we, shall we move on to dessert? What do you yeah. think? Is it time? I mean, I'm going to eat the rest so. of this dish of pasta, but just I've so been, I don't I've been do staring at mine. I've been staring at mine the whole time, so I made a, I made a mini, so mini dilemma. Let's see yours. All right, Let's I see have yours, to... Tim. So everybody show their glow. <laughs> oh, that looks good. Oh, well, don't lose it. Tim, well done. I know, I'm supposed to drop something. Yeah. So and my final cider is still in my fridge because it is and incredibly hot. A little bit of cream right for on top here. Yeah, whipped cream is good. You know, yeah. I'm okay. leaving you, Tim. Too. One second. One second. <laughs> it's just too. It was too hot to leave. To leave this poor cider sitting out. Yeah, I have to say. <laughs> so maybe Tim, I wonder if you'd kick us off by talking about um, the cider you chose so to go with with this dessert. One of the things that I'm hoping with this cider. So this is the Orchard Hill Gold Label cider. Now this is not really a dessert 
style cider. So I'm hoping everybody does not have this ultra cold. It really kind of can be a little bit warmer because when you have it like super, super cold, the acidity is going to be higher. And um, we kind of want a little bit of that richness to kind of show in the cider. So Orchard Hill is 30 minutes from here. They call this a medium dry style cider. So this is really not intended to be a dessert cider. But with this dish, with the rhubarb, because of the tartness of the rhubarb, and because we're only using, what is it, a quarter of a cup of sugar? Yeah, not much. Yeah, yeah it's very light. It's, yeah. like, it's, it's, it's such a minimal amount of sugar um, in this dish itself. And then the butteriness of the, of the pastry. So there's a number of things happening here, right? So the acidity of the rhubarb is going to hopefully work against the acidity in the cider itself and kind of uh, balance those two things out. Also with that little, if you did the dusting of a lemon, that's also gonna pick up some of those acid notes. Then you have the rhubarb, I'm sorry, the rhubarb is that kind of like part, kind of like profile. The butteriness of the pastry itself is going to work with, again, this is a cider that has been aged um, on the leaves, so you get that really ultra kind of like buttery sort of like profile. So that's kind of like what we're looking for. So we're looking for a little bit of complement in terms of the butteriness from the pastry and the richness of the cider, but we're also looking for a little bit of the, those that acidity to sort of like cut through and diminish the acidity in the rhubarb, but also in the cider itself. Um, and I think obviously the whipped cream or whatever could help. Um, I'm gonna try. And can you talk it for a second, Tim? Yeah, yeah. Try it. Try it out. Try it out. Go ahead. Tell me. Tell me what you're asking the question. Well, I wanted to hear if you could talk a little bit more about dryness in cider and what it means when we think about something as being medium dry, how that interacts with um, the various components and phenolics that an apple can bring in, just for folks who are maybe sure, yeah, thinking about so, this for, for the first time. Yeah, I think people think about something as being dry as being just one thing, but dryness is kind of like a range. There's a there's a human perceivable level of dryness that we essentially have, and this cider would be kind of just kind of like skirting that threshold of that sort of like level of, of sweetness per se. I think unfortunately people are afraid of having any sweetness with their beverages like cider or wine or things of that nature. And it's unfortunate because sweetness actually is one of the easiest, best things that you can actually work with in terms of creating really good pairings because Sweetness is going to sort of interact really well with a number of different things. If you have a lot of acidity, it's going to minimize some of that acidity in the dish itself. Um, if you have a lot of strong flavors like smokiness or spiciness, or um, if, for instance, this dish was really, really, the pasta dish, for instance, was really heavy on the Fresno chilies and it was really spicy, mm. that would minimize that that spiciness. So sweetness is a really positive thing. And I think people unfortunately run away from that all too often, but in, in reality, they should be kind of embracing it when, especially when you're having it with food. So dryness is, is essentially just the idea that we're talking about fermenting something till there's no perceivable general sugar in there, but there's always something that's unfermentable. There's, or otherwise we couldn't actually even enjoy the, the cider or whatever it is. If it has zero, I mean, like zero absolute, like no sugar, it's almost impossible to palatably take that on your palate. So we always want a little bit of sugar. And sugar is not a bad thing. I think people hopefully will kind of move beyond that. Is that kind of answering the yeah. question a bit? That's perfect. That's great. That's great. And well, I've just tried these together. The skillet is, is so nice. I, Susie, I was so interested. I hadn't seen. Um, this kind of double, like cooking the compote both in the crust and then also having the compote just as it is and the, the raw fruit. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you um, maximized all these different flavors in this, what could be a really, really simple dish that's become, I think, quite complex through some simple techniques again. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I definitely am not a pastry chef and I know very little about um, past pastry, but I think it's... Um, I look at it from like a culinary perspective of when you're building, when you're, when you have raw ingredients, like how do you build the flavors? And so I like the idea of having different components 
um, but they're made with the same ingredients. So you don't have to go buy 10 different things at the store. And again, the, the idea of like, what is this galette? This is like, this is celebrating the fruit that's in season right now um, in the Hudson Valley. And so um, the idea of cooking it down, creating that, that flavor, um, if you just had only the raw fruit, it would be, um, I think, it, it would be pretty boring of a dessert. Um, it probably wouldn't be be as exciting to to pair with cider. Um, and so by by creating that compote, even just like the little bits of ginger in there, the little bits of lemon, I think just create some nuance in, in the dessert. And again, it's about um, celebrating these fresh ingredients. Um, and who doesn't like a strawberry shortcake or you know some kind of dough with the strawberries on it? Yeah, absolutely fair. And what do we think of the pairing? Have you both gotten to, to try them together? I just did. It's it's actually, it's just at that point of it, it the, the sweetness levels are just right on the exact same level, almost, essentially. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, um, so it's it's right on that, that threshold. Any sweeter, and then it, this would maybe be a little diminished, but, mm -hmm. um, but it, it kind of works just, almost just about right, so... Um, I kind of got lucky on that one. Sorry. <laughs> I no, I totally agree, and I think I think I'm really enjoying that. I can like, I mean, obviously I can taste the fruit in the tart. That would be very odd if I couldn't. But it is it is helping me also to really taste the fruit in the cider as well. Which you know, um, particularly when we start talking about tasting notes in cider, sometimes we get hung up on making sure we don't use the word apple-y because that can be a, a shorthand for stopping us from thinking about the other flavors, but there is something really just wonderfully like apple skin uh, delicious about this cider that I feel like is, is coming out because of the, um, the richness of the fruit and the rhubarb in the dessert. So, so yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty great. Another thing yeah, I've, there, um, yeah. well, so, so since I made, I actually made this um, recipe just for the farm box and um, I've made this uh, strawberry rhubarb jam so many times that I started making it at work. And so we're selling it now in our provision store. And I made a hand pie with it yesterday. And we have a, we were in a special with brie and strawberry rhubarb jam on a toast. And so I think it's just something, I, I actually really love the sauce and, and you can put it on granola and yogurt in the morning, or you can put it on ice cream at night, or you can put it on a galette. So I think it's like a fun, easy recipe to um, kind of use often. Absolutely, yeah. and that's like exactly what you were saying about the, the pasta as well as Susie's like, one of the tricks to being able to cook seasonally, right, is being able to make something that can play in a lot of different ways and sort of understanding mm -hmm. the, you know, that this tastes great with anything bready, buttery, creamy, um, and being able to use it that way. Yeah, Tim, was there something you were, you were wanting to, to jump in with? I just wanted to say how really good the tart is. That's a really so great true. recipe. You made it, there you go. I, I know, but like, I followed your instructions to the T, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's just really good. So, well, thanks. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because this, usually this time of year we'd be having our um, our cider dinner up at at Glenwood, and we've so looked forward to having both of you there. But there is something that I'm really appreciating about the the empowering nature of these farm boxes and our um, sort of resilience as a community to find ways to come together even when we can't physically be together to share a meal. So. Uh, feeling a lot of a lot of gratitude for that, and hope that the folks who have joined us in cooking and tasting these things are as well. Um, so we're, we've been talking just for just about an hour now, and I want to uh, make space if there's anyone who would like to pop a question into the chat box. Anyone who would who would um, like to hear more about what we've been saying, and I'm going to ask Scott if you're still there, if you'd be willing to help moderate that and let us know if there are questions coming through in the chat box. That'd be great. Because I'm I'm not. Not personally seeing any, but I don't want to. I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. No, no, we can absolutely moderate it from here. I do want to point out, um, Ashley Henning did say, in fact, Suzanne, that uh, Susan, uh, you need to play your own show. <laughs> and I would agree. Maybe, your maybe not. Fantastic. Maybe not in my dark kitchen, but I did it all in one <laughs> one take, so that was pretty good. <laughs> it was very impressive. It was very, very impressive. Yeah. Um, we do have a question here. Do you see this, Megan, from Michael O'Leary? If you have leftover galette, do you put it in the fridge, keep it out? And thank you for doing this. Thanks, Michael. Um, so galette, uh, I would leave it out if it's for a day or two. I mean, the, the, the fruit is baked and it's um, it's got some sugar in there, so it'll be fine. Um, I would say for two days. Um, another trick is you can make the dough, galette dough informant, and just put it in the freezer. 
And then um, if you if your if your dough makes like four galettes, or if you want to make, I made a mini one today. If you want to make four small, you can um, you know make two and freeze the other two, and you can keep it in there for a month or two as long as it's wrapped tight. Um, so, you know, strawberries now and, you know, next month, if you want to have blueberries or cherries, you can mm -hmm. do kind of the same thing. Um, and that way you, the labor intensive part is the dough and you don't have to do that, um, every time. No. And if you, um, if you like it, just like an apple pie or something, if, um, if you do, um, you know, save it for the next day or two days after I would just pop it in the oven for a couple of minutes just to kind of refresh it. Um, and it'll, it'll taste great. Perfect. Perfect. Yes, we did get another shout out earlier. I want to point this out. Kathleen, uh, obviously, Megan, your colleague, said the dinner was so fast. fantastic. Thank you so much, Susie. So it's great to hear Thanks, from you, Kathleen. Thanks, Kathleen. <laughs> this has been really, really awesome. You know, one of the things that um, I started in this role on March 1st, as you all know, and one of the things that attracted me instantly to this community was individuals like yourselves who are all just so incredibly smart and intelligent and passionate and really believe in what you're doing in in your own spaces in the cider world and and i just can't thank you enough for um this evening tonight this has been really special and it's been really really wonderful to uh to work with you to put this together i also megan want to be sure and give a big shout out to lauren um i'm not sure i'm gonna pronounce her last name the right way Del delolio lauren delalio delalio, delalio. yes yeah yeah, did a, I, an I amazing job. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank She'll you. forgive me. She knows. She knows. I say it. Wrong, yeah. <laughs> um, she did a phenomenal job putting the whole farm dinner box together. Um, and then Tim, like, thank you so much for your support along this whole entire week. Uh, you know, not only for this amazing evening of pairing these wonderful ciders with this meal, but also your conversation with Kimberly at Metal House earlier this week is something I would encourage everybody to go back and watch. It was a Phenomenal tasting and really, some really beautiful insight into what Kim is doing over at Metal House. Um, and then also your conversation with the Meet the Makers the other night with Ryan Burke and Max Pritchard. Uh, it was it was really very special. Um, so I, It was really a fun, it was really a fun week um, just to sort of do that and, and getting to talk with Kimberly just alone was was very soulful and, and, and very special. So yeah, I definitely encourage people and if you want to learn a little bit more about you know, thinking of what's happening in the in the Hudson Valley in terms of cider making and and the way forward. Yeah, the other the conversation with the makers was great too. So Yeah, it was really amazing. Yeah, it was Carl Duhoffman as well was there, right? It was the three exactly. of them. Carl was... and Max and, and Ryan and um, yeah, I mean just great to have three different perspectives on on sort of where things are, are at, where those individual places are at and then direction what they see and what's what's important to them. I think that's you know that's a, that's a good thing for us to sort of look at as we go forward. So yes, completely, completely agree. Um, yeah, and so I would encourage everybody. You know, all the programming that's happened this week is on our YouTube channel um, at New York Cider Association TV, so it will stay there um, in perpetuity. And I hope everybody gets to enjoy it. Suzanne, I want to thank you. You know, um, we've had this conversation, but one of my last opportunities to meet with everybody before I joined the association was with you at 232 Bleecker Street. You prepared this lovely dinner for us, and um, it was just, it will always be sort of a highlight in that whole entire process. So thank you for that, and thank you for this evening. Um, this You're is welcome. really special. If I remember correctly, I think we crushed you guys with food, but. <laughs> you did. But it was, yeah, I think what was the scenario was like, just bring us whatever you think. And then we just got to taste got it everything. Yeah. It, was, everything. it was fantastic. And I cannot, um, you know, tell people enough that they need to run, not walk to 232 Bleecker Street. Are, tell me, are you all doing sidewalk seating or where are you at right now? Yeah, as far as we're open for about a week now. Um, we're open Wednesday through Sunday right now, um, kind of midday. And we'll extend um, the, the, some evening services soon. We've got patio seats outside. We're on, right on the corner of Carmine and Bleecker in the West Village. Um, and we'll have indoor tables as soon as phase three opens up. And, you know, we're trying to be safe. We purchase a lot of nice sneeze guards and, you know, six feet, just, just uh, wanting to, to make sure that everybody comes in that dines with us is excited to, to be back at restaurants, but also doing it in the right way. Um, but yeah, yeah, we're just, um, we're going to the farmer's market in Union Square four days a week and really just, just trying to, to really lean into um, those, those farmers that really need our support right now and kind of keeping the menu pretty small. Um, but I want to, you know, throw some roasted oysters and some stuff on the menu next mm -hmm. week. Um, 
we've got really delicious wines and ciders and um, and some uh, vermouth cocktails. And so it's, it's, a, it's a fun atmosphere if you're in the city. Yeah, and I, I loved, I think what you said earlier really nailed it about it just is really um, comfortable and accessible. There's nothing pretentious yeah. about it at all. And quite, quite the opposite, quite frankly, it's just a very lovely, comfortable, warm environment. And that starts with the, the beautiful menu and the food that you prepare. So uh, nice. yeah, I, I highly, highly uh, promote going. <laughs> it's a phenomenal space. And then Appreciate Megan, it. yeah, yeah. Megan, um, thank you so much for the amazing like hosting you've done this week. Um, personally, thank you. I think your conversation with uh, Stephen Satterfield on Monday around Race Insider is something that is continuing to trend. And I cannot uh, advocate for it enough. I continue to hear amazing things about it. And um, it was incredibly inspiring. And I really, really appreciate your sort of navigating that in such a beautiful way. So thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. Thank and I also just want to say a huge thank you to Pleasure. Glenwood, um, who, you know, Glenwood is is uh, certainly the founding sponsor of the New York Cider Association and then a huge presenting sponsor for our Cider Weeks. Um, the, uh, the partnership and collaboration we have with you both on a professional and a personal level is something that's so special. And um, it is, it's my thrill and honor to be able to say the final thank you to you and to Glenwood for hosting such a, a phenomenal event tonight and for being such an amazing sponsor for our Cider Weeks. We could not do it without you and for the association as well. So thank you so much for that. Thanks, Scott. A pleasure, an absolute pleasure and honor to work as part of this community and see the Cider Association um, thriving even in these difficult times. So thanks for all the hard work you put in. Yeah. 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 It's my pleasure. And yeah, it's a very interesting time, right? So we're wrapping up. Um, this is the final moment of our virtual Cider Week Cuts and Valley. We thought for a long time about whether or not we should do this and how we should do it, but clearly we did it and uh, it's been amazing. I want to give another big shout out to Rachel Freyer, who's our producer of Cider Weeks across all of New York, but she has been an amazing, amazing amount of like support and ideas and just she just makes it happen. So. Um, you can't ask for anybody better uh, than her to be engaged. So thank you so much, Rachel. It's been phenomenal. Um, and I think that that is officially wrapping up our Cider Week Cuts in Valley 2020. It's been great. Awesome. Well done, everyone. Yes. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you Cheers all so, so much. It's been phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.